Ravida is an action twin-stick platformer roguelite where you play as an unnamed child ascending an ominous and mysterious clock tower in pursuit of their lost memories. Throughout their adventure, the player will encounter many unique items and upgrades, different biomes, and of course, many secrets. And when compared to the many other modern action roguelites out there, this game may not look like much. But behind this cute pixel art hides many amazing modern roguelike design choices, including what I consider to be one of the riskiest core design choices I've seen in one of these games. This is Rogue Design, a series where we take a look at some of the most interesting and best designs in modern day roguelikes and roguelites. Let's go straight to the point and talk about this tricky design choice where in this game, while in a run, health is also your currency. This means that buying items in the shop, upgrading items, obtaining new relics and almost every action outside of combat will require some hit points as a trade. Now on one end, this does remove the need to have some sort of currency or experience points the player generally uses or expands during runs to buy or upgrade certain benefits, a common trend in most modern roguelites. But this does mean that health is more important than ever. Not only does taking damage get you closer to dying, but taking damage is equivalent to the player being robbed of their money. Imagine if that were the case in a game such as Hades where one poorly played room would not only bring the player closer to death, but could also end up resulting in them being broke. And this feeling can and will be experienced in Revita. If the player takes too much damage before entering a shop, not only will they be more at risk of dying, but they won't be able to buy any items to help them out in this dire situation. With any sort of progression requiring health, this system ends up being the ultimate win more design. If the player is healthy, they can use hit points to obtain many upgrades and items that will not only make them stronger, but make it less likely for them to take damage in future rooms thanks to all the powerful additions, resulting in more hit points to spend for future upgrades, and the cycle continues. But on the flip side, if they start a run taking significant damage and arriving at a shop or a statue but cannot afford to spend any health, future rooms will be much more challenging due to the lack of items making the run significantly harder from the start. There are a few kind of like aspects to the game that personally I'm not unhappy with, but from a business side might have not been the smartest things to do. The The big idea behind Ravita was to take the idea of risk versus reward, which is like kind of like the driving force of every roguelite and kind of see how far that could be pushed to create like very interesting player agency. But the issue that that brings with it is that it makes it very hard to get into. But also on the other side, if you get too good at the game, it comes to a certain point where it starts potentially becoming irrelevant um, because that risk changes depending on player skill. This design is indeed incredibly risky for a game. By being so punishing, Revita may not feel fair to many people, especially since players are a little forced to be somewhat aggressive for them to be able to restore or increase health. Using a page from Hollow Knight's book, the player will restore health by collecting souls from defeated enemies and will have some sort of combo meter that will slowly diminish if enemies aren't defeated fast enough, which increases the value of souls. This could add some sort of pressure to the game, but being able to understand that this bar is not a priority is important since the risk of taking damage is much worse than losing a bit of your combo meter. Being able to take it slow even if the game is pushing players to be quick is an important part of mastering this game. Because yes, every hit matters, meaning every mistake will have an impact on the entire run. Similarly to, for instance, playing the robot in Enter the Gungeon, where the player's health is turned into armor and every hit is therefore lost forever, or playing a run of Hades with lasting consequences, making it hard or impossible to regain any health lost. These similarly make taking damage much more impactful, but the distinction is that these examples are optional and not a part of their game's core design. So how does Revita make this work so well? Well, it's because the game is very rewarding. Similarly to beating a hard boss in a Souls-like, Revita heavily rewards players that do get past that inherent difficulty. And differently than a Souls-like, Revita's core gameplay is actually not incredibly challenging, simply punishing, where every tiny mistake is more impactful than most other games. This means that once the player learns the ins and outs of the game, such as enemy patterns, getting more comfortable with the controls, understanding possible item combinations and such, players will eventually be able to outsmart the game. 
If players have prior action roguelike experience, then it's only a matter of time and patience before they learn the game well enough to benefit from the win more design. By combining an overall simple gameplay but mixed with a punishing mechanic, experienced players will constantly feel rewarded because of how much the skill factor impacts every run. If a player knows every enemy pattern and is a master of the overall gameplay, the game will reward you by allowing them to keep more health, therefore getting more powerful. And once again, with this overall simple core gameplay, this isn't too hard to achieve, as long as players are somewhat comfortable with these kinds of games. And this is why even though I am a huge fan of Revita, I understand that this game heavily rewards me for my prior experience playing roguelites, meaning that I probably can't recommend this to everyone. But for those who have experience, I think Revita is one of the most rewarding roguelites out there. Now, design is one thing, but what about the gameplay? I didn't mention previously that the gameplay is overall fairly straightforward, but does that mean it's uninteresting? No. While many of the mechanics may not be unique or revolutionary, what it does is done very well, taking inspiration from many other popular indie games. The games that have inspired me the most are probably other roguelites. Your Dead Cells, Enter the Gungeon, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of Finding of Isaac in there, since that's the game that got me into roguelites. But there's also like a bunch of other things like Celeste that played a big influence, not necessarily in the art, but like the, the way the platforming works in regards to like accessibility, that kind of stuff. Like um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of Hollow Knight in there, just for the, the, the overall atmosphere, the whole, uh, regenerating health is very heavily referenced from Hollow Knight. So yeah, there's a, a lot of games. The controls are precise and responsive, where outside of the usual shooting, jumping and dashing, the game uses gravity to expand on these mechanics further, such as being able to hold down in midair to fall to the floor at very high speed, or shoot under the player's feet at the correct time to propel themselves even further or even hover a little longer. These mechanics will generally not feel intuitive to new players, but mastering these specific moves will once again reward players for mastering the game's unique physics. At an experienced level, these will allow them to move drastically different and will be used in almost every room. Especially since players are required to move around instead of taking a safe spot in the corner of the room because enemy souls are crucial to pick up, which is a great way to drive players to work with the level design and push the skill capacity even higher. Not to mention with how diverse each room can be from one another, good mobility is very important. Especially in the public beta of the game, where the level design was drastically expanded, as well as many other features. One of the biggest challenges in developing the game was the level design. I'm personally not a level designer, so one of the things that I early on decided, because I looked at other roguelites and I was just like, oh, a lot of roguelites, especially like smaller ones that don't have like the availability of like games like Enter the Gungeon or Isaac, where the developers on that have a lot more time to fine tune their levels, make just a lot of levels. I decided to try to figure out a way to procedurally generate all the levels. And so, that, so then over multiple months, I came up with a system that I was quite happy with that then made it into the public version. The only issue with that is that, generally speaking, the way that system was designed, it made for very rectangular rooms where the biggest difference were just like, oh, like sometimes it places a platform here, sometimes it places a platform there. And so with the beta and the 2.0 in general, that was one of the things I wanted to expand on. Just making sure that like, no, it's not just like rectangles, like they're also like, other kind of like layouts that the procedural generation can build upon to expand like just the variety of level design. And also obviously the, the combat encounters um, exponentially. A quick note I want to touch on, at the time of recording this, the public beta has improved on many aspects that I originally had issues with, mostly linked to some items and weapon balance, as well as overall synergies being more reliable and interesting. One of the advantages of the independent industry is the benefit of having a community a developer can use to playtest, try out new features, and listen to the feedback. That was one of the reasons that we even wanted to do a beta for the 2.0, was that there were a lot of changes in the beta that changed the game quite drastically, like in the way the game flows, in the way you play the game, the way you approach the game. And so I wanted to make sure that before I put that in like a public version, um, there would be a way for the community to test this uh, and make sure that, you know, like a majority of the people at the very least would be happy with those changes. If you play Revita through Steam, I would strongly recommend playing on the public beta. 
Especially with the unfortunate news of Revita 2.0 not being released anymore, this may end up being the best and only way to play the game. Now, of course, Revita is a roguelite, so how is its replayability? When talking about an action roguelite, one of the most important aspects in my eyes is how different each individual runs are and feel from each other. For me, this should include some sort of customization prior to each run. I have played many roguelites that I enjoy, but will tend not to play for many hours just because of how slow, limited, or repetitive each run starts as. Revita, on the other hand, does not have this issue. Not only can you choose a different weapon, each with its own aspects, changing the gameplay of each run, as well as being able to increase the amount of shards, progressively increasing the difficulty of the run per shard, with, for the most part, unique gameplay changes the player has to adjust to, but most importantly, tickets. While venturing the clock tower, players will occasionally find tickets dropped by enemies at random. These tickets are completely random and serve zero purpose while playing. But once the player ends their run and starts a new one, they will be offered a choice to use these tickets found in their most recent run in order to alter the start of their upcoming one. Each ticket may come with wildly different effects, such as a random stat increase, pickups, and of course, items. But the catch is, of course, as everything else in this game, equipping these tickets will cost some starting health or even max hit points. I love this system, as it may well be one of the biggest risk versus reward the game has. They allow each run to start truly unique while giving the choice to the player. I've had times where my tickets were so powerful that I ended up using all my health, starting one hit away from death, but managing to survive the first few scary rooms long enough to stabilize and beat the game as well as runs where I started off very tamed with just a single minor item, but enough health to quickly use my hit points on items very quickly and beat the game. Another side to the tickets is the fact that, since you need to find them during a run, the game discourages players from starting over early on if they weren't happy with how the first few floors or rooms went, or if they were given RNG they weren't happy with. Now, this could be seen as a pro or a con depending on your perspective, Personally, I do like that the game pushes players to continue on even if they had a bad start. Because once again, the secret of this game is comfort and knowledge. So if a player were to constantly restart, looking for the best possible RNG, they might not end up experiencing the game the way the developer intended. And if someone really wanted to start over early or just died in the first few rooms, they could always spend a few of the hub world's currency to purchase more random tickets for their next run. Speaking of the hub, it's nice. It starts off fairly empty, in theme with the game's overall story and mood, and progressively gets filled with many NPCs and even cosmetics. These suspiciously looking Hollow Knight characters are all very charming, and each has its purpose. The caretaker keeps track of the player's achievements and will reward them with new unlockable features every time an achievement is completed, which is a great way to encourage players to go for different achievements and goals. Not only are there many unique achievements, some with very interesting challenges, but these rewards can be quite substantial, including blueprints. Blueprints can be given to the Tinkerer. This character will allow you to exchange this game's actual currency collected through runs in exchange for permanent features such as cosmetics, but more importantly, unique features within runs. Many of these are straight benefits and tend to be easy to unlock but others are more unique, such as the possibility to encounter specific special rooms, vending machines, unique chests. Once bought, players are given the choice to activate them or not for all future runs, meaning if a player isn't a fan of a certain specific room or possible feature, they have the option to disable these choices. This gives another layer of customization that I haven't seen many games use, although one of the reasons is that this can be a little too easily abused. If certain blueprints are much stronger than others, it is possible to only enable a few powerful ones, making runs much more consistent. But giving the option to players is a nice touch. Players can also use the hub's currency at the Imprisoned, where they can unlock items permanently and add them to the pool for future runs. One nice feature is the fact that, when buying one of these items, the players will start with it on their next run, with up to a maximum of two per run. Not only is this another great way to have a unique run start, but the game doesn't give any information as to what this item is until they've started the run. Meaning that even though this gives a quote unquote free item, it may not be beneficial at all depending on what else they got at the start. 
It's a great way to bring another layer of mystery and excitement to the game, as well as make every item interesting from the start. Instead of just unlocking a bunch of items mindlessly, this gives a sense of importance to every item and will help players remember each one of them more consistently. There are plenty of other characters and features, such as the hat vending machine, where players can purchase different hats that will change the protagonist's head. And while this could have simply been quick pixel JPEGs, many of them come with unique animations and cute details, which I find amazing. There's also the fisherman. Yes, this game has fishing. Because why not? As well as a very helpful librarian who will keep a record of pretty much everything, which is something I always enjoy in these games. Especially here, where you can learn more and actually understand more nuanced details the game has, such as all the possible status effects. In the open beta, she also comes with a list of simple goals that players will automatically complete through runs that will reward them with hub currency, rewarding players for simply playing the game. An easy thumbs up in my book. Players will also have an idea of how many enemies they haven't encountered yet, which I always find exciting, noticing an empty square waiting to be uncovered. The same goes for every item, possible synergies, as well as a list of all the possible curses the player may encounter. Curses, or cursed effects, are very common in these games since they are usually linked to some sort of risk versus reward, which is again very important in roguelikes. And they can be encountered in many different ways in Revita. Tickets may be equipped in exchange for a curse, some items will inherently come with one, or be purchased in exchange for another curse. In a way, curses are another form of currency in this game. Instead of using health, many situations will instead give the player a curse. And while these curses are random and drastically different from one another, the player will always get to choose from two curses, another great example of impactful choices. The more curses the player has, the higher the chance of finding more ways of getting cursed within the run. And with each cursed carried, enemies have a chance of being corrupted, increasing health and speed, as well as adding more difficult bullet patterns. But on the bright side, these corrupted foes will have a chance to instead drop two souls instead of one. And while this idea was inspired by the corrupted enemies in Enter the Gungeon, who also dropped more money, souls in Revita are much more important, since they contribute to health, the most important part of this game. This adds a legitimate strategy to curses, since it may actually be beneficial to be cursed if the player feels confident enough. Just another great example of risk versus reward. Now before talking about the final important topic, I'd like to take a look at the story. Many roguelikes out there tend not to have too serious topics or even any lore at all, because of the inherent indie side of things and with how modern roguelikes will often prioritize gameplay, many of them tend to be more ridiculous or even goofy, which is completely fine for most of these games. But Revita doesn't shy away from seriousness and instead uses its serious tone to encourage players to uncover and learn the many mysteries of the character in the clock tower pushing players to play further and further in order to unlock more meta progression and unveil the lore. In general, like personally, I have a very big interest in like very heavy, emotional, like very melancholic storytelling, I guess. Uh, one of the, funnily enough, one of the key words during the development of Revita was just the word melancholy as the way to describe the game and like in its artistic aspects, as you said, the story, that kind of stuff. Yeah, just a lot of like, I wanted to kind of like tell a story that has like a message and a meaning behind it that's not just like oh you know like we just needed a reason for you to get a to the end of this like i wanted to actually you know say something with the game not only will you rescue many npcs unlocking them permanently giving a great sense of progression and reward but the game also features quests and secrets that will open different paths to alternate biomes and even a true ending with a mighty final boss the meta progression is an amazing way to keep players engaged in games that inherently have a lot of repetition. A roguelike that is fun but doesn't give anything new or exciting after having beaten a run early on can risk becoming too mundane. But this does require a lot of work to implement, and can even be a risky choice if not enough players end up finding these features. Because at the end of the day, if a game isn't enjoyable from the start, Many players may never see all of the content hidden away in the progression system, but when it does work, the game always feels exciting to play and uncover what and where the next secret may be, something I think Revita does very well. And of course, last but not least, let's take a look at this game's items, the relics. 
Just like any other roguelite, Revita offers many relics to encounter throughout each individual run. One aspect I really enjoy here is that the game offers many opportunities to find relics during runs, more than the average roguelite. On average, when I play, I might add 3-4 to four new relics per floor, which I was generally able to select from a pool of options, with each floor taking roughly 10 minutes. Not only does this add constant diversity very quickly, but these items tend to be very unique and synergetic with almost any possible build. Generally, when a game has a wide selection of items, most of them will tend to be number adjustment items, such as basic stat changes. But Revita has so many relics that will change the gameplay and may even push the player to adapt because of them. Some items, such as the frog gun, do come with a straight stat increase that is always beneficial, but may have an effect that could actually encumber the build depending on the type of run they've stumbled upon. So many items come with straight benefits that will still require the player to put in some thoughts before picking it. And if an item ends up being perfect for the build, each floor ends with the option to upgrade every relic up to three times for added benefits, in exchange for hit points, of course. But the amount of times I've spent in this room contemplating on whether I should or what to upgrade shows another great layer of thought process and another awesome example of risk versus reward. The fact that every item has a chance of being exciting and never truly useless is a great example of good item design. And this is a game where players can end up becoming completely overpowered if given the right combinations. Having ridiculously powerful runs in roguelikes is satisfying, but can be dangerous to implement. Games are played to have fun, obviously, so feeling overpowered is a great feeling. But making sure that a game doesn't always give you this power is important. For instance, the first time I played Crap Champions, when it first came out, I very quickly and effortlessly became overpowered. And after realizing that I could find ways to become close to unbeatable 20% of my runs, it quickly pushed me to stop playing the game because features and enemies didn't seem to matter anymore. But since then, the game received drastic balance changes and I am now thoroughly enjoying playing it again. Revita will reward players every now and then with very powerful builds, but these are far in between and tend to feel rewarded as opposed to completely random. Randomness is obviously a big factor, but players will need to earn getting to these situations where a run has the potential of being overpowered. In conclusion, I think Revita is in my eyes an amazingly well-designed modern roguelite, with a core gimmick that may be challenging or intimidating at first, but very rewarding. I am surprised that the game didn't get more recognition, because it definitely had the potential of being one of the best, especially with everything Ben Starr had planned. I'm very sad to hear the game not getting the very anticipated update it deserved. But even so, I hope Revita doesn't fade away, and I hope this video may bring more people to try this hidden gem. Huge thanks to Ben Starr for agreeing to an interview with me. If you wish to hear the entire interview, I'll have a link below to our full conversation. And if you like this kind of content, feel free to like and subscribe for more deep dive game design analysis videos. Thanks for watching.